her work has shaped really uh, a, a generation and more of, of other scholars, and she's been extremely influential on Supreme Court case law in this space. And fortunately for those of us who work on platform regulation writ large, she has been expanding her attention in recent years to look at questions about Section 230 in the US, uh, about immunities, about what the law might look like if there were something like a notice and takedown regime for defamation, if we somehow moved in another direction in defining what the obligations of platforms are uh, in response to other kinds of regulated content besides copyright. Uh, and so Pam is gonna talk for about half an hour and present some slides explaining the what we know, what we have learned from the history of copyright in the DMCA and how we can apply it to this broader set of questions. And then Mark and I are going to uh, ask some questions and then we will move to audience Q&A, including Q&A from the Zoom. Take it away, Pam. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> Glad to be here um, and uh, thank you for coming. Um, so this is the overview. Um, I'm not gonna go through it, but you can see that there is actually a plan. Um, uh, I think it's important to kind of understand uh, both uh, the background rules uh, in place before section 230 and before the DMCA section 512, uh, because um, uh, that's actually a place where um, uh, we started um, and uh, things got better, I think, because of 230 and because of uh, Section 512, uh, but um, uh, that this is where we came from. So I think we start with the Stratton Oakmont case, um, uh, which ruled that Prodigy could be held liable for defamatory things that, uh, that some of its users uh, said on the uh, on their platform uh, because they held themselves out as regulating and making sure that sort of unlawful material was not going to be found on this site. Uh, and they missed something, but um, uh, the court basically suggested uh, that you could be held liable even if you didn't know about it because um, uh, you do some content moderation, that means you take some responsibility. Um, <clears throat> so that was a kind of a uh, a, a strong liability rule. There was also in copyright, uh, a strong liability rule uh, also in the Playboy versus Frena case, a bulletin board service was held directly liable for uh, its users having up and downloaded um, uh, and displayed uh, photographs uh, that Playboy magazine um, uh, owned copyright in. And so, uh, that was a direct liability, not an indirect liability claim. And the Clinton administration, uh, as part of its national information infrastructure, uh, white paper on intellectual property rights, uh, agreed with the, the Playboy decision and actually also went further saying that all online service providers, including internet access providers, uh, should be and were strictly liable for every copyright infringement that happened on their site. Uh, and they wanted that rule to be adopted as an international norm. Um, and that's not where we are now, but that's where we started out. Um, obviously, the story of uh, Section 230 is quite well known. Uh, after the Stratton Oakmont uh, decision, uh, two Congress people decided that uh, that decision would be hindering of uh, the growth of internet services. Um, and so uh, they um, uh, proposed this uh, law, which became Section 230, um, uh, which says that no interactive computer service shall be treated as a publisher or a speaker of information uh, provided by another. So um, uh, this goal was, main goal was to promote the development of these new uh, internet services and prevent crippling liability, which would throw thwart that particular goal. Um, and it got folded into the uh, 1996 uh, Telecommunications uh, Act um, and wasn't really very controversial at the time because most of the people in Congress didn't know anything about, uh, about the internet. So um, uh, they just sort of waved it through. Um, uh, the first significant case that got to the appellate courts uh, was uh, Zoran versus AOL. Um, uh, Zoran was a guy who I think has a real estate business in Seattle, Washington, and all of a sudden he starts getting harassing telephone calls and death threats because um, uh, somebody had advertised 
on AOL some t-shirts that basically glorified um, Timothy McVeigh and the Oklahoma City bombing um, and uh, uh, said calls Ken at this particular number to get one of your one of these t-shirts um, and people hounded him for doing that uh, and he was uh, he complained over and over and over again about uh, the um, uh, the ads and AOL people said, oh, we'll take them down, but somehow they always remained up. Uh, so finally he just got uh, tired of that and brought a lawsuit against AOL claiming that they were negligent because he had told them about the ads and he told them about the harassment and they, they uh, were negligent in not doing anything. Uh, the Fourth Circuit um, decided that Section 230 uh, immunized AOL from liability it was, uh, AOL was an interactive computer service. Uh, it was a third party, somebody that we don't know, actually is an anonymous person, uh, was, the, uh, was the poster of these ads. Um, and um, the court decided that, um, uh, that the liability theory that Zoran was making was predicated on AOL having kept up these uh, ads. Um, and that was a kind of publishing activity uh, and therefore that the, there couldn't be liability. And then decades of precedents have followed uh, this broad reading. Um, again, the court really took a lot into account uh, that Congress's goal was to enable these um, uh, internet services to thrive and to not be subject to uh, crippling liability. Um, now, 230 has been kind of steady for a really long time, for decades. Uh, but Justice Thomas, a couple of years ago, um, uh, published a statement um, in connection with the Supreme Court denying cert in a case called Malwarebytes. Uh, and he agreed that the, that the, the Supreme Court shouldn't take um, this particular uh, cert, grant the, this particular cert petition. Uh, but he took the occasion to say that Section 230 has been interpreted too broadly. Um, Section 230 doesn't say anything about distributor liability. Uh, and again, uh, the background rules of, uh, of distributor liability, um, the Smith versus California case, um, uh, the Supreme Court decided that it was inconsistent with the First Amendment to be for distributors to be held um, uh, liable for an obscene book unless he knew that it was in fact obscene. So. Um, uh, so that was a shot across the bow. The question was uh, what was going to happen thereafter. Um, uh, it was pretty clear from that statement that he was going to be one of the people asking for um, uh, another uh, justice or, or three to join him in taking um, uh, one of the 230 cases that came before uh, the court. Um, and the next thing you know, uh, Gonzalez versus Google is actually um, uh, before the Supreme Court now, uh, and in keeping with this thing that, this, that uh, Justice Thomas said uh, in the malware bites uh, statement, uh, some of them were suggesting interpreting Section 230 so interactive computer services can be liable after getting notice of harmful content, content on its site. This would, in fact, reverse uh, the Zoran decision because AOL had plenty of notice uh, about the uh, uh, defamatory or uh, the harmful content that was on its site. Um, and it would in fact uh, impose a notice and takedown regime um, akin to the one in the copyright side, but without the limits that are built into uh, section 512. So let me now turn to the origins of the DMCA. Um, so while the Clinton administration's white paper proposing strict liability for all um, online service providers uh, for user infringement was being debated in the halls of Congress, uh, a district court uh, in 1995 decided this one particular case uh, called Religious Technology Center versus Netcom. Uh, so Religious Technology Center uh, actually owns the copyright in Scientology texts. Uh, and uh, one of the former Scientologists um, basically typed in 65 pages of the uh, of the Scientology text uh, into a bulletin board service uh, and uh, um, RTC found out about it uh, and then uh, contacted Netcom saying, hey, this is infringing stuff, please take it down. 
um, and um, uh, sort of the Netcom said, I don't know anything about this. Um, and so the question is whether um, the, uh, the liability rule that um, the Clinton administration had endorsed uh, and that the Playboy decision had um, held was a kind of strict liability uh, to Netcom because there were copies being made in computers when uh, when somebody sent uh, this infringing material through the uh, Usenet servers um, that was kind of popping up all over the world. And so there were copies of the infringing material going on and so Netcom could be held liable. Um, and the district court decided that that theory would make copyright uh, infringement too broad and so uh, rejected that particular um, theory saying that only volitional acts by humans um, uh, are um, uh, triggering of the uh, copyright reproduction right. And so um, that was a rule that then said that they're not liable for stuff. Um, and then when it came to the question about, well, you know, RTC gave Netcom notice about the infringing material and, you know, under Section 230, they don't have to take anything down. Well, there's an exception to Section 230 for copyright um, because the um, uh, Cox and Whiten actually recognized that um, if they tried to include copyright, the Hollywood go, would go crazy uh, and the bill would never pass. So uh, there wasn't an equivalent of Section 230 at the time. Um, uh, but what happened was the district court kind of used a little bit of common sense and said, look, before you had notice, that there was this infringing material um, and what the material was and where it was, you didn't have any liability. But once the uh, once the uh, once you get notice, um, then you have a duty to investigate and the duty to take it down or disable access um, if, um, uh, in fact, it's infringing material. Uh, and if you don't do that, then you become a contributory infringement. Uh, infringer because you are materially contributing to the infringement by uh, by keeping it up uh, and you know once you get noticed that in fact it's infringing. Uh, and so um, this decision came down right at a time when uh, the telecom industry and the internet industries uh, and Hollywood were like duking it out um, in Congress about copyright. Uh, and what ended up happening is that the Netcom decision kind of created two important baseline rules, right? So one was that internet access providers such as Netcom um, uh, for uh, essentially when they're acting as a conduit of transitory copies that are passing through their system, they're not, um, they're not liable at all. In theory, that doesn't have a notice and takedown uh, requirement, but the recording industry has been pressing on uh, and, um, uh, uh, Cox uh, Communications uh, was found to have um, uh, been awarded um, $1 billion of uh, damages against it because it ignored the robo notices of uh, uh, Cox uh, user infringements. Uh, so notice and takedown is not supposed to be part of that game, but um, uh, under the, those decisions, it might be. Um, there's a, a, a Separate one for system caching. There's been hardly any litigation on that at all. The big deal is Section 512C, which is uh, where the online service provider stores uh, content uh, at the behest of its users. Um, and I'll talk just briefly about the Viacom decision, which talks, uh, which interprets that particular um, safe harbor. Uh, and then uh, there's also um, a, a safe harbor uh, for information locating tools. Um, the system casting, storage, and lo information locating tools uh, all have notice and takedown uh, requirements uh, uh, to them. Uh, but you don't get it just because you're an online service provider. You actually have to have uh, adopted and reasonably implemented a policy to terminate um, uh, about repeat infringers, including um, uh, under what circumstances to terminate people. Um, uh, as yet, um, here we are from 1998 to now, no consensus on what exactly um, a repeat infringer policy needs to look like or what the criteria for termination need to look like. 
Um, uh, there's also supposed to be no safe harbor under Section 512 unless the online service provider accommodates and does not interfere with standard technical measures that copyright owners are using um, uh, as to their works. Um, uh, this is actually something that the uh, Hollywood industries worked really, really hard to get into the statute, but it's been inoperative since 1998 because there are no standards technical measures and the effort um, in the last couple of years uh, to revive this idea um, uh, has been rejected by the Copyright Office as really infeasible given the current state of technology. Um, a more meaningful thing is the designated agent. You can understand why you want to have a designated agent. Um, if there's been some sort of infringement, you need to know who do you contact to be able to tell that person um, uh, that there is infringing stuff and take it down. Um, there's a limit on uh, damage liability, uh, but um, uh, you, injunctions can issue. Um, so far, hardly any, I think, have issued because if it's stuff taken down, you don't need an injunction. Okay. So there was a big battle over this, and I, I won't get it, I won't go into detail, but the copyright industry was still trying to get really strict liability rules. Um, and, the, um, uh, and the telcos and the internet companies pushed back hard. Uh, and finally, we're kind of sent into one of those smoke-filled rooms you read about um, in um, uh, stories about Washington, DC. Um, and they came out with section 512. But uh, essentially, the technology industry got a little bit more in 512 uh, because they gave up something in respect of section 1201 about the anti-circumvention rules. Um, and so the content industry never liked the compromise in the first place, and they've been fighting about it ever since. Um, and so you can expect them to continue uh, to fight about it um, and to try to get new legislation if courts don't do what they want. Uh, so the copyright industry's got some things out of the, uh, out of the bargain, but um, uh, a really important set of uh, um, uh, rules built into the Section 512 Safe Harbor um, uh, focus on the specificity uh, of the notice. You can't just say, hey, there's some infringing stuff of mine out there on your site. You basically have to identify what is the work, who is the copyright owner, where is it located, because I can't take it down if I don't know what it is and I don't know where it is. Um, uh, so the rules got uh, got develop so that notice has to be quite specific. Um, there's a counter notice procedure so that if the person uh, who's now client ch charged with uh, being an infringer uh, says, no, that's fair use, or no, that's licensed, or no, that's something that you don't have any rights in, um, that the, the, they can give counter notice. This doesn't actually work very well, but um, uh, at least it was sort of an effort to build some due process into the, uh, into the section 512 um, conversation. Um, and if a copyright owner sell, uh, sends a false notice, then uh, it's possible to um, uh, sue for monetary damages uh, for false representation. Um, again, that's not very useful either, but again, it was an effort to sort of say, hey, there are these other kind of interests here. Um, probably the biggest deal is you have to have actual knowledge of infringing contents um, to lose the safe harbor, um, and you don't have any duty to monitor it. So to say, what one thing did they want the most out of this uh, compromise? They wanted the no monitoring rule. That was the, that was the big deal. And it wasn't just uh, because it would be expensive to monitor, but there was a real concern about users' freedom of speech, freedom of expression, fair uses, um, user privacy. If you monitor everything that everybody says all the time, uh, then uh, there's more likelihood that there will be um, uh, less freedom and less privacy for people. Um, and so the big test case uh, was the Viacom versus YouTube case. Um, the evidence was pretty clear that in the early days before Google uh, acquired um, YouTube, uh, there was a high volume of allegedly infringing material on the site and you know they were not going to do anything about it um, uh, uh, until they got a, a notice uh, about uh, infringement um, and so you know if only the common law 
theory about uh, contributory infringement and vicarious liability were in place, I think Viacom had a pretty strong case. Um, people were coming to the YouTube site because they could get access to some infringing content. Um, they were well, the founders were well aware uh, of this and seemed to be welcoming it. Um, they didn't take any action until the takedown letter got there and they refused to, to use technology to uh, detect and stop infringements. Of course, content ID today uh, does uh, that, but, um, uh, but that, was the, that was the background. Um, and the Second Circuit um, decided that actually, I'm gonna pay really close attention to what the statute actually says. Uh, and uh, it interpreted uh, section 512C to require online service providers to have actual knowledge of specific and identifiable infringements in order to impose liability. Um, and the reasoning was sound, right? You can't take it down if you don't know what it is and where it is. And so you have to have that kind of knowledge in order to have that responsibility. There is an alternative theory um, and the, sometimes known as the red flag um, knowledge. And what the Viacom was trying to do is persuade the, um, persuade the, um, uh, the court that red flag knowledge is, well, you had reasonable suspicion, you probably should know that, that there was stuff, but um, you just didn't, didn't investigate because you didn't want to know about it. Uh, and the Second Circuit rejected that interpretation saying, no, the second provision um, requires the ISPs to be subjectively aware of facts that an objectively reasonable person would realize uh, identified specific infringing material. Again, you can't take it down if you don't know what it is and you don't know where it is. Uh, and the Second Circuit stuck to the, uh, the language of the statute and Viacom's red flag theory uh, was inconsistent, said the court, with the no monitoring rule, which is found in section 512M. The content industry, as I said, never liked the compromise in the first place. And so uh, they, um, uh, they had a lot to say when the Copyright Office began um, a process of gathering information about Section 512 and how it had been interpreted over the years. Uh, and in May of 2020, they um, published a report to recommend some changes uh, to Section 512. Their overall conclusion was that the uh, balance that, uh, that Congress had intended to achieve in Section 512 was not being achieved. There's too much infringement, so changes are needed. Uh, and they were critical of a number of the decisions, including um, uh, Viacom versus YouTube. Um, the part that I want to emphasize here uh, is about the knowledge standard. So um, uh, the Copyright Office recommended some changes to Section 512 to make it real red flag knowledge um, so that you have a duty to monitor. So the, the Copyright Office said, you know, the reason that there's no monitoring rule is to protect user privacy. It's not really about protecting the um, it's not really about protecting uh, the, um, the online service providers themselves. Uh, and so um, uh, they think that there should be a duty to monitor and to find uh, infringement if you have uh, any reasonable suspicion that there is stuff on your, um, on your site. Uh, and they want to also ask that um, treat willful blindness. So um, uh, as something that... Um, uh, YouTube was, uh, was willfully blind to uh, infringement and so they should be held. So even though they didn't know any specific ones, um, uh, now they, they knew that there was that stuff out there. Uh, and so there, there was uh, then uh, a kind of an effort to kind of move in the direction of a duty to monitor um, the contents. Now there have been um, a few, not very many, um, studies published about the section uh, 512 notice and takedown other than the Copyright Office. Uh, and um, the, uh, I'm gonna give you a few slides uh, about this uh, because it tells you kind of like what's really going on in the world um, as opposed to what the Copyright Office says. Um, uh, so overwhelmingly uh, online service providers fall into what um, Jen Urban and her colleagues um, called the DMC classic OSPs. They get relatively few notices of infringing material. They do a human review of each one of them. They respond 
um, uh, sometimes taking down more, sometimes taking down less, depending on what their risk profile is. Um, there is um, a smaller, but uh, still significant group uh, of online service providers that have gotten so many notices that they have started automating um, and also working with um, some trusted senders. Uh, so if, the, uh, if one of the Hollywood um, uh, studios, for example, uh, says, I'm gonna, I promise you I'm gonna only send things that are good. Um, uh, then um, uh, if you're a trusted sender, I'll be, basically do an automatic uh, takedown. Um, and then uh, for um, uh, what uh, Jen and her colleagues call the DMCA plus, um, that's when you basically put in place filters and the like, and that's content ID. And of course, fa Facebook has something like that too. Um, in respect of, uh, of the kinds of uh, notices that, uh, that these systems uh, get, so um, again, this, this data is pretty old, but it's hard to collect this kind of data. Uh, but Wikimedia um, uh, gets some requests. Uh, it doesn't grant very many of them. Uh, Reddit um, grant, granted even smaller percentage. Automatic was more 50-50, um, and uh, Google got um, 92 million uh, requests just in one month, uh, and 94% um, of those requests were uh, were granted. So there is a real concern that um, uh, that if the DMCA rules get stiffer, right? If the 512 gets uh, uh, gets um, uh, amended uh, as the Copyright Office wants, that uh, that there will be a greater push toward more automation and greater push toward uh, filtering mandates, um, and so there's a real concern that uh, actually um, this isn't uh, going to be a good thing for um, the kind of ecosystem of online service providers that we have today. So um, the report concludes that Section 512, as it is, is central to managing copyrights online these days, um, um, and uh, the rise of automated detection and uh, systems um, uh, is uh, raises questions about accuracy uh, and due process, uh, and the counter notice uh, system has not worked well. Um, lots of lots of defective notices, um, and so sometimes the notices are facially de deficient, as in there's not enough information. Sometimes um, uh, it looks like the notice got sent because the content is critical of the uh, of the person that um, that sent the notice. Sometimes fair uses. Uh, but quite a few of the of the um, um, notices that uh, that uh, the study showed were um, uh, were deficient had to do with trademark infringement, privacy, publicity rights violations. Something didn't have anything to do with copyright, and therefore no obligation really to take down uh, any material. Uh, but online service providers. Um, uh, often take down challenge content, even if the use might be fair, because they don't want to um, have to deal with uh, litigation. So what are the lessons here? Um, uh, I think if notice and takedown becomes the new interpretation of Section 230 uh, under the Gonzalez case, uh, again, I don't think it's going to go that way, but it could. Um, I think similar problems would likely arise. It's always easier for online service providers to take down challenge postings rather than to contest them. Uh, complaints will often be incomplete or baseless, especially if they are automated. Uh, and complainers always want more regulation. They never, ever come to satisfied with what they get. Um, and a notice takedown in Section 230, I think, would be worse in some respects because um, uh, 512, for all its failings, actually has some built-in safeguards that aren't present in, in the um, uh, Section 230 context, context, such as what is adequate notice, um, um, uh, how specific or how general uh, does the notice have to be. Um, there's no, no monitoring obligation um, and no counter notice uh, and penalties for false notice. Uh, so um, uh, this could get worse uh, rather than, uh, than uh, just be as bad as in some respects uh, Section 512 is. So a thing to know is that you know, when Congress granted both Section 230 and 512, 
um, immunity and safe harbors, it was an early growth stage. There was a lot of optimism that, oh, everything was going to be just great, um, that uh, limits on liability would promote the growth of the in internet economy and flourish um, uh, free speech and human values. Um, and there was some confidence, not really by Hollywood, but some confidence by some people that the online service providers would be um, would act responsibly um, uh, if there was illegal content on their stuff. Um, uh, and now here we are um, uh, 20 some years later, um, big tech is widely viewed as having too much influence and power. Um, uh, some uh, online service providers have abused uh, the privilege and from the standpoint of the people who want to um, uh, who want to uh, challenge both 230 and 512, um, they think that the providers actually make money from illegal content and they have too little incentive to take it down um, and therefore they call for more regulation to, to rein them in and make them more accountable. Um, uh, so what's that, what, what is it that they really want? They really want monitoring rules. They really want the uh, obligation to monitor. This is especially uh, um, evident from the uh, Gonzalez uh, case against Google. Uh, so Gonzalez argues that Google knew that there was a large quantity of terrorist content on YouTube site. Uh, and under Gonzalez's theory, it had a duty to take action to eliminate that content and kick the terrorists off its site. Uh, but they did next to nothing. Um, uh, and um, uh, although the issue before the Supreme Court right now is a different one uh, than, um, uh, than that duty uh, to uh, take action, that's what Gonzalez really wants. Um, uh, and so it's important, you know, grasping on to the algorithmic recommendation uh, theory of liability as the only thing that the Supreme Court was willing to consider. Uh, but of course, the Copyright Office report that I talked about um, is also consistent with the content industry's preference for putting a burden on online service providers to monitor uh, for infringements um, and uh, what are the collateral damage uh, consequences of this? Um, well, freedom of expression, freedom of speech, fair use, um, user privacy, and online service providers freedom to design their businesses and carry them out as they choose. Um, all those things are, uh, are really at risk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pam. Uh, so Mark and I are going to ask some of our super expert questions for like 15 minutes and then we will shift to taking questions from the room and from Zoom. Feel free to post questions on Zoom now. Uh, they will show up in my phone and I will ask them eventually. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna start with a question that might be really simple and may have a very short answer, um, but, but I just, I kind of wanna get clear on it. We've seen a lot of proposals recently to replace section 230 with something else uh, in defining platforms liability for things like defamation uh, or for things like the um, terrorism related claims in Gonzalez. Um, but we also see proposals to just cross section 230 out, just make it go away. And then whatever claims there are for liability, for platform liability, um, just let those be litigated under the background law, let the chips fall where they may. Um, and I assume from what you've said that you would say that a notice and takedown system like the DMCA is better than that, <laughs> that we're better off with a DMCA-like law. Is that right? Yeah, I, th I think one thing actually that, um, uh, that I didn't talk about in the interest of time, but is worth pointing out now, is that many of the countries in the world actually use notice and take down for everything. Okay, so the European Union's um, e-commerce directive uh, has uh, a, a safe harbor um, uh, like we have in section 512, not quite as shall I say, developed um, uh, a framework, but it has uh, a notice and takedown regime, but not just for copyright, for everything. Um, so some part of the world has been living with notice and takedown for everything. Um, and you know, I would say that the DMCA is a little bit better because it does have some, it has some, it has an 
effort to basically put some balancing principles in place. Uh, and um, I think that courts in the US would invent some doctrines to limit liability to cases where there really was some sort of real fault. Um, uh, but, um, uh, you know, how do I know that this particular person posting um, uh, about this third person, um, how do I know it's defamatory, right? It's, it could be true. Um, as, a, as an online service provider, I'm not really in a good position to make a determination about whether that's in fact. I can't investigate. In some sense, copyright infringement for all its um, uh, good and bad things, you can at least tell a little bit more easily whether something's an infringement than I think you can tell whether something's defamatory. Yeah. So uh, can I follow up? I, I, I mean, it, it's interesting to me the sort of proposal Right um, for notice and takedown. I mean, so one thing is is worth noting, right? As Pam does that, um, some countries use this. I also feel like some companies just use it as the default, right? That they have, you know, um, we have this mechanism. We've created this uh, place where you send notices. Uh, you've noted that a bunch of people send things that are actually not copyright notices that are trademark or privacy or things. But I think a bunch of companies just kind of like accept those and do whatever they're going to, you know, do the takedown procedure. I, I'm curious about the sort of politics of this, right? I mean, maybe it's a reasonable compromise, especially if, if uh, as Daphne says, the alternative is nothing, right? Um, but I guess it isn't really, to me, it, it isn't really what either side is, that, that, that's trying to reform Section 230 actually really wants, right? And so one of the curious things about Gonzalez versus Google and Justice Thomas is, the right wing's view of Section 230 is uh, it enables too much to be taken down, uh, right? People can take down content we don't like. So both Texas and Florida have passed laws that say all uh, 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 content that is not sort of banned speech must be permitted uh, to stay well, up. And you can't censor. Right. That's a, the, the, the way that they, they, they phrase it is that um, Florida and Texas uh, residents uh, have uh, a right not to be censored when they utter hateful but lawful speech, um, and that's the that's the that's the place where they um, they feel that. But you're right. right. They, well, right, and, but so, right. So that I mean, leave aside the question of whether I mean there will, there will be no internet. Uh, 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 there will certainly be no social media in that world. Right, everything you will have will be spam and porn, and uh, and it has to come. It's all legal. Uh, uh, we have to allow it, right? But leaving that aside, it seems to me that sort of the notice and takedown idea that would be replacing Section Two Hundred and Thirty is, in some sense, the opposite of what the conservatives want. Right? They want they want sort of like stay up anyway, uh, and not even sort of voluntary acts by the companies to take them down. Um, is it is it closer to what the Democrats want? I mean, the Democrats, I think, would like to have, you know, hey, let's just take hate speech off the Internet or some some Democrats would. I, I, I guess I'm trying to figure out what the who the sort of constituency is for this middle ground. Well, the Supreme Court, um, yeah. right. If the Supreme Court decides that a notice and takedown regime is something that they can wrap their mouths around um, as an interpretation of Section 230. They, you know, as you as you wrote in your uh, imperial court um, uh, article, um, they think they're the only people who count now, um, uh, and so their interpretation of Section Two Thirty, it's not like let's say the Supreme Court and Gonzalez does this. I don't think they're going to because the issue that they took the case on is a very different um, issue. But um, if not this case, another case, they, they decide that 230 is in fact a, a, a notice and takedown regime because distributors aren't mentioned in that and distributor liability can be premised on the notice. Oh, of, um, then, you know, the, the companies would have to decide uh, how they're going to uh, how they're going to deal Got with it. it. Yeah, okay, guess I guess I've been envisioning this as a something Congress might do, is since everybody on both sides seems to be uh, want to get rid of two thirty or reform it in some way, right? But so the so the idea I guess would be 
uh, we say, well, we're not treating you as an internet content provider if we hold you liable once you are aware of the content on the uh, on your site, and then we'd effectively notice the takedown. I take it, yeah, right. It wouldn't even be sort of we wouldn't even need a pr properly characterized notice. It would merely be once you are on notice, whether it's red flag or you happen to run across it or anything else. That's if you one, are aware yeah, of it. That's uh, one of the really big deals. Okay, so that five twelve. Um, specificity of the notice is really, really important because um, what Gonzalez wants is for if there's any terrorist act anywhere in the world and there's some connection with, between that group of terrorists and YouTube, that, that Google will be liable um, in treble damages for the harm to an American citizen who was injured by that anywhere in the world because they didn't take enough action. Um, so that's, there's no specificity about the notice. It wasn't like that, that um, you know, in terms of even the algorithmic, um, uh, the algorithmic um, uh, recommendations, it's not like YouTube had a special algorithm just for terrorist content. And in fact, that was one of the most, I think, interesting of the uh, parts of the oral argument in the Gonzalez case is that Thomas seems to have thought that there was a special algorithm for, for terrorism. And then when he was told, no, it's the same algorithm as they recommend for everything. For rice pilaf. Rice pilaf. His example, as I remember. Yeah, it's like, well, it's the same one, <laughs> rice pilaf or terrorist content, whatever it is you're looking for, right? And so he kind of goes, you could see him kind of like, oh, man. <laughs> so, but of course, it seems like the most that the Supreme Court could bring into being is knowledge-based liability yes. or knowledge-based loss of immunity, which is what the EU has had this whole time. Um, you know, the court couldn't move us to a world of the kind of choreographed um, notice and takedown we get with the DMCA, where there's at least some attempts to bring in the rights of internet users and, and speech rights and access to information rights as, as part of the balance. Um, so, and I'm, I'm curious if we, sort of if we did move to either the knowledge-based takedown, you know, vague knowledge-based takedown that the court could, could grant us, um, or, or to, to something more like the DMCA, um, and extend those systems to claims such as defamation, um, or claims such as the, the terrorist content claims that we see in Gonzalez, do you think that would play out a lot like the DMCA? Would we get about the same rates of error in the accusations, the same rates of compliance? Like what would be different because of the ways in which those claims are different, if anything? Yeah, well, I think one of the things that's interesting about the, um, uh, the, uh, the 512 study that Jen Urban and her colleagues did uh, was that, you know, different, uh, different online service providers had different risk tolerances. Um, so some, some took it down a lot, and some of them basically said, no, I'm going to make an individual determination. One thing that I found really offensive in the, in the uh, Copyright Office 512 study uh, was the notion that once a, an online service provider gets a compliant notice of infringing material, so it says what the work is, where it's located, etc., they have to go take it down no matter what. They cannot make, in the Copyright Office judgment, you cannot, the online service provider cannot make a determination that in fact, this is fair use, or they can't make a, uh, a, a decision that this is otherwise a non-infringing thing. They have to take it down no matter what, if they get a compliant notice. Now, as you saw from the, uh, from the data that I cited, you know, Wikipedia takes down some, but not very many. Reddit takes down even less. Um, and so they are making determinations now, at least some of them, uh, individually about whether to take something down when they get a compliant notice. But this kind of like strict liability, you know, if you don't, um, if you don't take it down, um, even if it was fair use, it's like that really is a bad thing for users and it's a bad thing for platforms and it's a bad thing for 
Everybody except the people who complain. Well, it's going to, and it's definitely going to be weaponized, right? I mean, it is already abused in the copyright context, right? But it's absolutely going to be weaponized in the free speech context, right? So I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't like, um, uh, you know, uh, conservative politicians, uh, uh, you know, offering thoughts and prayers after the latest mass shooting, right? So uh, I complain about it. And probably in an automated system, certainly if you have the copyrighted notices to you, but 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 probably even if the answer is just there's a risk of liability and we get millions of these a day, you take it down, right? So I can pull off any speech I don't like. Of course, they're going to do the same thing in return. Uh, now, so I guess the question is, is there any way to stop that sort of cycle of abuse uh, and take down? Uh, I mean, in theory, I guess we could try to deter or punish false takedown notices. My sense is that has not worked well in uh, in the copyright office, copyright law where we have an actual statute that says you can do it. Courts are still reluctant to do even attorney fee shifting. Yeah. Um, and then I guess, yeah, and then I guess the question is, would there even be a cause of action, right? I, I send a notice saying, uh, hey, I think this person has engaged in unlawful speech when I know they haven't. Maybe it's fraud, I guess, but... I, I just, I, mean, I guess I'm, I wonder if there's any tool you can imagine sort of that's going to stop the cycle of weaponization of, I take down content that I don't like. I don't see what the limiting principle is, unfortunately. That's the, um, I mean, people try filing tortious interference with business relations claims uh, now, and they get preempted by 512C. <laughs> so, you know, at least in the context where a bad faith takedown request affects somebody's commercial interests, there's like maybe this little hook to object. But, right. but, but not you know, your that's political interests. Not your political okay. interests, not your generalized speech interests. Um, so we have some questions coming in over Zoom and are there people who want to ask questions in the room? If so, please raise your hand um, and Ben will bring you um, bring you a microphone. Um, so one question that came in was you talked about barriers to entry and sort of regulatory compliance being a barrier to entry that might help, I, these aren't your words, but sort of entrench incumbents and make it harder for new market entrants to come along. And the question was like, well, but aren't all regulatory requirements barriers to entry? Like, isn't there, and now I'm putting words in the questioner's mouth, but aren't there situations where we, we welcome regulation nonetheless because the barrier to entry is acceptable for the upside that we are getting. So how, how do we know when, when a lot yeah, of the DNCA I mean, is, is okay? I, you know, we didn't talk, so much talk about sort of the reform of intermediary liability um, in Europe, uh, but they have gone through a major transformation of their, both on the copyright side and also more generally for uh, intermediary liability. Um, and, um, you know, uh, the safe harbors that, uh, that companies had uh, benefited from, um, you know, the reason that there's been so much flourishing of internet commerce in the United States um, is because of section 230 and section 12, 512, which they're not complete um, uh, uh, shields uh, from all kinds of uh, things that might happen, but they're pretty, um, they're pretty important in terms of sort of at least giving you some breathing, uh, breathing room. Uh, but you know, for the companies like uh, YouTube and Facebook, um, they are less unhappy about stricter regulations because they benefited from 512 and 230 when they were real little guys. And now pulling up the ladder behind them um, is actually not something that's so terrible for them. Uh, so the place where the entry barrier happens uh, is that you know Facebook and, and, and Google will be able to accommodate whatever regulatory structures there are. Um, I, uh, I participated in a, a conversation recently about um, the European Union's uh, in Artificial Intelligence Act, um, which is going to impose a really high set of responsibilities 
on um, uh, developers and deployers of AI systems. And, you know, uh, I was the, I was a, I was the only American on this particular panel, um, other than people who were going to be subjected to the regulation and therefore they had reason to sort of be cautious about what they said, but I said arbitrage. Arbitrage is a big deal, right? If, um, if, if I was an AI company, um, I would not start up in, in Europe. You have to be crazy to start up in Europe because you'd already have to take on this huge set of responsibilities. Um, and in the United States, okay, they're talking about uh, regulating. Um, uh, and the FTC has said, of course we have laws on the book already that will uh, we'll do it. But um, if you're a European and you wanna do a startup and AI system, you come to the United States, you build up your business, you get to a point where you have enough of a sort of a presence that actually it's worth going back to Europe and complying. Um, by then they might actually have figured out what's a realistic thing to do in terms of regulation. Um, but um, but arbitrage is going to be, I think, a really important thing. And I think that's, well, arbitrage does help to explain why we have more thriving businesses in this space than, than others. Yeah, and there's actually pretty good empirical evidence on that. I would, can I ask a question about the AI thing in particular? Because sure. I, I, I can imagine a world in which we just sort of end run the entire notice and takedown regime. And, I, and this might be true for copyright as well, right? So, so I think increasingly, right, what we're likely to see is not um, here is a st static uh, content or here is a static link to uh, uh, content that you can take down in a meaningful sense, but we trained our uh, AI on a bunch of things, some of which turn out to be defamatory, uh, some of which turn out to be copyright infringement, right? But what we now have is a model which generates responses to questions in real time. And even search engines are increasingly looking like, here is the response to the question you are asking and not here is the link to the web page, right? Does notice and takedown sort of even work in that model at all? I mean, I, I guess you could say, take me out of your training data set, right? And in theory, the next time you update or populate a, a model, maybe it is trained differently. But what I think people would want, which is don't have your AI tell people that I am uh, guilty of this crime, right? Or don't have your AI sort of generate a song that's too similar to my song, right? Those things are not gonna be happening in a static way that you could just take down. Point well taken. Sorry, that was a law professor question. <laughs> the implied isn't that right at the end. <laughs> I mean, also there's even pre-AI, there's a certain amount of just automated tools speaking to each other in the background going on already. One of the interesting things that Google disclosed in, for that copyright office study was that for um, web pages removed from search results, uh, more than 95% of the no DMCA notices that they honored were for web pages that weren't even in search results in the first place. Yeah. And, and it was because they're sort of the same URL structure is generated time and time again on places like the Pirate Bay. And so the, the um, machines at the right holder end, you know, preemptively generate a bunch of URLs that they know are going to exist. And at Google's or, end, they're- Or like, once existed, but no longer do, and they don't even follow. So you know, like, forget the good faith requirement to sort of that I looked at this and know it's infringing. They don't even follow the link, they find the link. And so what Daniel Singh's study showed, right, uh, six months after mega upload went down, right, was taken down for copyright infringement, there were still hundreds of thousands of notices being sent for mega upload links. And it was pretty obvious, right, that right, what they found is there's a stale link somewhere. We saw it had mega upload in it or the name of our copyrighted work in it, and we just generated an automatic takedown notice. We didn't even sort of go through to look at what the site was to figure out that it's not there. Um, so another question coming in from Zoom, and I think this is a really good question, is what's so special about copyright? Like, why do we have this system for copyright and not have it for the other things you know, we as a country might choose to prioritize for in our legislation? I think the best answer to that question is that there is um, a very well-organized uh, copyright industry community that, um, uh, that will pay a lot of attention when it comes to defamation when it comes to hate speech, when it comes to other kinds of disinformation, it's like there's this, uh, the kind of the communities that care about that 
it was just too flat, right? There isn't kind of this kind of, um, you know, there's a collective action problem. Um, and so you have with the copyright industries, um, you have a group of people who are very, 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 very intent on protecting their interests. So uh, maybe a related question to that is about how we magically got to a statute in the DMCA that did at least try to negotiate a balance between three competing rights, the rights of copyright holders, the rights of platforms, and the rights of the users who are going to be affected by bad takedowns. Um, you know, somehow in that smoky room for, for DMCA section 512, we did get provisions that speak to all of those things at once, whether or not they got the balance right. So why isn't that happening now? with the proposals to amend section 230 and you know is there something to make that happen now i don't know i said it's just a different time um i think the other thing is remember the section 230 or what we call section 230 of the communications decency act it's actually not really section 230 of the communications decency act uh, the Communications Decency Act that got struck down by the Supreme Court uh, for First Amendment violation was passed in the same bill um, uh, as uh, what became Section 230. Um, so you know, they got passed together. They were completely contradictory to one another. This one got struck down and we ended up with Section 230. I don't know they were completely contradictory. I mean, they were the the way in which they were aligned was the idea was uh, right. We'd be worried companies would be worried that if they tried to actually do voluntary filtering, then they'd get stuck in liability. And so, as part of a bill that was designed to sort of take porn off the internet, uh, good luck with that, right? Uh, but that was that was the bill, right? Um, we enabled voluntary efforts for people to take stuff down by making sure that you weren't going to be held liable for yes. taking those voluntary efforts. So they were they could at least be aligned. It ended up, I think, having a life of its own even after the bill gets struck down, right? But. Yeah. Uh, so another question that is oriented more toward teaching experience. Um, I, for a generation of law students that graduated 20 years ago or so, if you wanted to serve the public interest on the internet, often you looked at copyright holders as the bad guys. Um, and I imagine that you and I have both had the experience of teaching students now who want to promote the public interest on the internet, and that means that tech platforms are the bad guys. Um, I'm, I'm curious if you think, like, is there a way to promote some more robust understanding of the public interest? Do we always need a bad guy? Do you have a nominee <laughs> for another bad guy? Uh, like, what is the future of public interest tech law? Um, so I think the best answer is that we should not think of Facebook, Google, YouTube, um, Amazon as equivalent to all of the platforms. Um, I think that we should uh, recognize that um, overwhelmingly uh, the, the services that many of us find uh, useful, whether it's um, uh, fan fiction or whether uh, it's knitting patterns um, uh, or Etsy, there's lots of lots of stuff out there that actually is beneficial. And so working to promote those um, entities as uh, sound um, parts of our ecosystem, I think is a good thing. So um, uh, I'm, I'm still thinking that uh, you know, there are some reasons why regulation might be better um, on some dimensions. Um, I'm not sure that any of the bills that are pending right now are ones that I'm necessarily ready to endorse, but, um, uh, but I do think, you know, cracking down on, you know, on uh, sites for not letting you quit, right? Uh, the FTC um, has been criticized for a bunch of things lately, but I think that the idea of, um, saying that if it's really easy to sign up, it should be really easy to get out of it too. Um, and that's something that's, you know, that's a small touch um, uh, regulation, but it seems to me that that's the kind of thing that uh, I'd like to see more of. Good. <laughs> uh, we are almost at time, but I'm, I'm gonna try one more question off of Zoom. 
uh, which I'll paraphrase as what's so bad about filters, or to put it another way, you know, knowing that they're going to err on the side of taking down the wrong things sometimes, but also accomplish what they're supposed to sometimes, that how do we know when a filter is bad? Well, one of the things that, um, uh, that the Digital Services Act is going to do is uh, require a little bit more uh, transparency. Uh, and so, you know, I think auditing of uh, some of these systems to see how accurate they are um, uh, is probably something that would promote the public interest. Um, uh, you know, it's still a very early days of the, um, uh, of the uh, use of these um, uh, much heavier regulations uh, against the essentially filtering mandates for online content sharing systems. Um, the, the large ones are subject to much heavier regulation now, um, and they're supposed to uh, install filters, uh, but they're supposed to actually only use filters when it's really, really, really infringing, and not when it's just maybe just a little bit infringing. Now, how do you know? Um, you can't really, but, um, uh, but to the extent that there's sort of an effort to get a little bit more transparency uh, about sort of how effective these, uh, these filtering systems are, um, maybe, you know, I mean, they do filter for some stuff, right? I mean, one of the reasons why there isn't even more hate speech on the internet is because a lot of the platforms actually do use um, automated content filters to get rid of uh, some of the hateful things that people say. And some of the things you say that are misinterpreted. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, right. Has anybody who's <laughs> ever been in, been put in jail on social media? Uh, right. Um, great. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Pam, so much for coming. It's really an honor to have you here. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to post this on YouTube so everybody can check it out if they didn't catch the whole thing. Thanks. Great. Okay.